Hi, Greg Weldon here. Welcome back to Money, Markets, and New Age Investing. The bull market and volatility certainly is upon us, and it's almost like we talk about polarization all the time. Even my opinion is polarized right now because the markets are polarized, not really in their opinion necessarily, but in the sense of, you know, that we see the economy starting to slide, the thought process from the Fed would be we're going to keep pushing until there's pain in the economy. Pain we're seeing certainly in the housing market. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, so it's kind of like, okay, the Fed needs to stop raising rates because of this pain that we're seeing economically and because a lot of people at certain income levels are really choking, man. And I'm, we'll talk more about that in a second too. But then I say to myself, but I understand where, you know, Jerome Powell is coming from in the sense of, can you really say we're going to pause the tightening campaign when still inflation is, you know, six plus percent? But more importantly, when gold is rallying and, you know, not too far away from $2,000 an ounce, I mean, can the Fed end their rate hike inflation fighting campaign when gold is making headlines by breaking out through $2,000. Because you know when they do that, the dollar will decline. Because that's been a big part of this monetary tightening has been the monetary conditions tightening from the dollar. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But in the near term, the, the polarization of my opinion is that, you know, I see the economic pain coming. We know what's going to happen. I've talked about this on this podcast and numerous times about the three things, you know, the hat trick of economic recession, food inflation at home above 6%. It's been twice that. It's still 11. That is this number, you know, strike one if you want to make it a baseball analogy since spring training has sprung. Uh, when you talk about the number two, which is the yield curve inverted, the most inverted since the 80s, and number three is the dollar of 20% over a 12-month period, which it was as of last May and then again in August. So those three things are 100%, at least in history, doesn't mean, you know, we're, we're at the casino here and you can't, you know, get a double zero green. But in the context of where are we now with the Fed, we see some of this pain why aren't they backing off? Is it irresponsible or not? And this uh, d dynamic really takes you all the way back to 1979. I recently did a research piece on this. The things that Paul Volcker said when he first testified as Fed chairman, he had already testified as a Treasury Department official uh, uh, before, on Capitol Hill, but his first testimony, his first question and answer, the whole testimony, all nine yards as we headed into Jerome Powell doing that this week, from 1979, is really interesting, man, because he's saying all the things that Jerome Powell's saying now. Jerome Powell has told us he's a student of the 70s, that Volcker was his hero, that inflation, first of all, will never, like that, will never happen on my watch. Eh, thank you for playing. We already lost that one. We have a nice parting gift over here, but a job that who wants? I mean, this is such a hard job. So I try not to be too critical because I wouldn't want this job. There's no answers. But at the end of the day, he has told us he knows the playbook to follow here to defeat inflation, which is draconian interest rates. The problem is the inflation is so high and they started so late that they still are behind the curve. If you say they want to be restrictive and restrictive is 100 to 150 basis points above the rate of inflation with Fed funds. Now, inflation could fall and make that happen. And I think the base effect might have played a role in that. But that is becoming less of a factor because of food prices. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. And this was one of the things I said could be a risk to the thought process. The base effect would bring inflation down, which it will. You'll see some of these numbers come down because energy is going to come down. But what's interesting is you saw even in places in Europe where inflation came down, the core rate rose. The core rate, meaning X food and energy. And food inflation is making new highs pretty much everywhere. So that's part of the problem. But when you get back to Volcker in 1979, where Jerome Powell is now, he keeps saying, we need to see the pain. And it is the same words that Volcker used, that not doing anything, not being vigilant here, not being even overkill, because we can reverse if it gets really bad. We know how to fight you know, a recession. And thank God they've got rate cuts back to use, because you know, if they hadn't acted even you know, when they did, late as it was, we'd really be screwed. So, you know, we see the pain economically, but the problem is, and where I'm, again, my, my opinion is polarized, we don't see the pain in the markets. We don't see the disinflation in the markets. We have gold still hovering around 1950 within 100 bucks of making a new high, right? In euro, it's even closer, right? And Europeans are a whole nother story, and we'll talk about that in a minute, too. We got a lot to talk about today. 
But in this context, the stock market too. I mean, the S&P's rallied. It's got back to a certain you know, technical levels on the upside. Now it's back on the downside. I mean, the volatility's all over there. Price movement really isn't. But the pain is not in the markets. The disinflation is not in asset prices in terms of stocks and in terms of some of these commodities. Copper's still hanging around four bucks. You know, so in that context, you also then kind of look at well, where the pain. We see the pain in the economy, the housing market, the mortgage market is crashed. Fifty five percent decline in activity for home loans, uh, 90 plus percent decline in uh, activity for loans for refis. All right. Now you have you have the whole dynamic around existing and new sales pressing the trend lines to go back to the 2009 lows or before that. Right? In the case of existing sales, you're talking about a 40-year uptrend line that's being threatened here in terms of the seasonally adjusted annual rate of sales. Right? And what's even more problematic is starts and permits have also now fallen where they're about to break trend lines too with big declines. And that sets up the next big inflation because you don't have enough homes. And now you're not going to build them. You know, So when interest rates eventually do come down, man, the housing market is going to be really hot in terms of prices. But the next phase does is not does not look like that right it's more pain to come how about the consumer we know this in the consumer all right savings pretty much gone spent earnings well you get your paycheck it's worth it buys you less by the time you cash it at the bank credit record credit borrowing record credit creation record loans taken out by consumers in 2022 and i mean by far eye drop you know and really jaw dropping eye popping you know type of numbers really was and in that context Especially now is credit cards. You know, you already see the kind of turmoil in subprime auto loans. Jeez, you know, we called that one, you know, that, that was like months ago, right? We started to see that because delinquency rates have been held down by forbearance and now they're popping and it was inevitable and you could see it coming and you knew when it was going to come too. And now it's here and everyone notices in holy mackerel, it's a problem. Well, of course it is. All right. You have record borrowing by consumers on credit cards when the rates are the highest ever. You're talking, you know, I mean, you go back to, okay, you go back to the, to the 80s. I'm talking for most people that are listening to me, at least. Um, but seriously, you're talking 20 to 21% in the actual, you know, the cards that get charged, all right? And the way the Fed breaks this data down is really fascinating, all right? And they give you all these numbers, man. You're talking about 13% in 2018. That is now 20. Highest rate to borrow money and record borrowing. It's not sustainable, we know what's going to happen with the economy. Conference board numbers this week were really interesting. All right. I have a chart of that that we're actually going to throw up on the uh, Twitter and Instagram feeds. All right. I mentioned this last time. We, we, February was a kind of a messed up month with traveling. I ended up getting stuck in Canada for a while because of lack of air, airplanes. But to whatever degree, uh, there will be some charts that we're going to tweet and put on Instagram that will relate to some of the things I'm talking about here today. One of them is the conference board. All right. You're talking about the plans to buy a, a, an appliance, plans to go on vacation, plans to make major expenditures. All of these things are plunging. The consumer cocoon is being spun. It's hardening right before our eyes. All right. When you talk about retail, Dallas uh, does the, you know, the Dallas Fed does, of course, the manufacturing, the service sector and a retail sector survey. Retail revenue is plunging. This stuff looks recessionary. From the Richmond Fed to the Dallas Fed to the to the Philadelphia Fed, these surveys throw in the ISM, you know, and the manufacturing side at least, and it's been really bad. The service sector is another story. You still see signs of life. Certainly the ISM service sector numbers have been stronger. And, you know, while there are some holes in that, there really are. Okay, there are some real strong parts of it, too. So that's interesting. But if you listen to the comments that come into some of these things, all right, it also plays out like, uh, well, you know, we're, we're preparing for a slowdown. We see a slowdown coming. So even within that confidence, there is a, a degree of pessimism going forward. The conference board, there was a great uh, part of the conference board's report that showed that about how expectations are now so much lower. Expectations have been this low since like 2014. And expectations lead present conditions and are leading to the downside in a way that is downright ominous. So from that context, you kind of wonder, you know, 
where do we stand here? All right. We know too that in terms of the labor market, well, what is what is bad in labor? I mean, it's tight. Yeah, it's tight because so many people left and didn't come back. Well, they either came back because they had to, because inflation's up, or they stopped getting money for nothing. All right. And you had great flow for a few months there. You had exactly what you wanted from the labor market, which was people coming into the labor force and all of them finding jobs. The people unemployed already in the labor force finding jobs. We had several months of what you would call near narvonic payroll numbers. Now, isn't that a prelude to loosening in the labor market? You don't hear the complaints about the lack of available workers as much in these surveys, commentaries from companies themselves. You don't. All right, there's still a scatter, scattering, you know, scattered out there a little bit, but it's not as, you know, it's certainly not as intense as it was. You see it, all right? So the Fed is waiting for this last indicator, and you say, why are they waiting? Well, they're waiting because of the markets, all right? The two year note just got above four and a half. I mean, this thing was trading 430, wasn't going to move to five, no matter what the Fed funds futures did. The Fed funds futures for 2024 have been pricing and easing until this week, until this week. The 2024 June Fed funds futures market had an implied rate of below 5% and below four, you know, it was basically below 475 for a while. I mean, it got really low. At one point, it was three and a half. Three and a half. It was pricing in like at that point, you know, 175 to 100 basis points of easing in the first half of next year. So the Fed can't stop when that's the picture in the forward Fed funds when they say, we have to be restrictive for a longer period of time. So what do they do? Well, I mean, I think this is where they're waiting for pain in the markets. You're talking about, again, the yield curve versus where the stock market is. All right. I did an interesting uh, research piece recently on bonds versus stocks here. All right. Stocks are just shy of new highs relative to the 10-year T-bond, the benchmark uh, cheapest to deliver uh, T-bond price. I mean, it's virtually a new high. That has to change. And I have said before, and I'll say it again, what if it doesn't change until yields start coming down? Well, why would you say that, man? What is wrong with you? Is something wrong with you? No, think about it this way. When yields start coming down, that means real yields will be rising. All right? And in the sense of inflation maybe coming down even faster, you could have a situation where, you know, real yields, I mean, you know, nominal yields are coming down, but real yields are rising and positive. Think about that. That can happen. And in that case, that might bring the pain to the stock market. It might come when people are least expecting it. It could be the Wiley Coyote market. They talk about this all the time, and now more people are using this theme. Why? Because it's a good theme, all right? And in the sense of the, you know, you know the old cartoon, the roadrunner is chasing the coyote. The coyote rather is chasing the roadrunner. And I've always said the roadrunner is inflation. You know, and finally the coyote goes flying off the, the cliff. You know, it was one of those things where the Fed starts tightening. The coyote flies off the cliff, has no clue. All right. All of a sudden he kind of just thinks to himself, okay, well, the Fed's going to pause. So everything's okay, right? I'm going to be okay. And that's when he looks to the side, looks at the camera. And then when he realizes the Fed wants pain in the markets, disinflation in asset prices, that's when the coyote looks down. And we know what happens next is the picture of him spiraling, looking back up at the camera with the canyon below him, right? It's perfect stop. I mean, it really is funny. Um, so where does that take us? All right. Well, it takes us to another thing that I see in the markets, which is gold versus the dollar. When you take the gold adjusted value of the dollar index, simply the dollar index divided by gold. It's not rocket science, but it gives us a great proxy for conditions tightening or loosening in terms of monetary conditions. And when you plot it against the Fed funds futures, it's been very tight until the basically last August. Right when you know Powell first dropped the thought process that maybe the Fed could take their foot off the brake, and you know all of a sudden stock market explodes, gold goes back up, dollar comes off hard, and that was the beginning of a big dollar move down. Right, well that adjustment, all right, or the gold adjusted value of the dollar actually went to a level that was basically kind of implying a two, you know, two percent Fed funds rate based on monetary conditions, based on what the dollar was doing, because the dollar was now coming down and taking back all of that appreciation it had when it was tightening monetary conditions. It was helping the Fed with their cause. So in this case, again, it's kind of up to the dollar. And this, so this is one of the things we got to really be watching. And when you take it then and you start to talk about what, is the, what does the chart of gold look like, it looks exactly like the euro currency. And that's really interesting to me because a lot of this has to do now, in my mind, with the ECB. 
Because who's further behind the curve than the Fed? The ECB sure as hell has. I mean, they really are. And when you talk about the numbers that just came out this week from Europe, from the ECB, money supply is falling. It's deflating. I want the fastest rates we've ever seen. It's true, too, if you use some of the measures in the U.S. as well. Money is, is getting crushed at a time when prices are still rising, and the Fed is trying to get monetary conditions to tighten. Well, I mean, would you say when money is shrinking, that might be an over-tightening? I don't know, but to whatever degree it's happening in Europe, we're seeing particularly now because it, it's, it's a delayed reaction. It's like the what's happening in the two-year Schatzi in Germany is what was happening last you know, April in the U.S. two-year note. And call them both. I mean, these were you knew it was going to be explosive upside moves. The two-year Schatzi at 37 basis points when German inflation is 9% is insane. Problem is, it wasn't a straight road. It was a very volatile road. Tough trade to even have on, even when you're right. And that's part of the problem with some of these markets right now, the volatility in the moves that basically end up going nowhere. But sticking with what we're talking about, which is really Europe, all right, you now have a credit crunch developing. It's early stage, but government borrowing, of course, which was through the roof, is now contracting, and that's a big impact on money supply, number one. But number two, it's also corporate credit and, more importantly, consumer credit. And more importantly, consumer credit in terms of loans, for a consumption, which is now threatening three percent, and was you know talking six percent not that long ago, and then for home purchase, falling fifty basis points on a year-over-year -year basis in just the last month to below four. So these things are starting to see a more global dynamic for sure. All right, you're going to have this in terms of a country like Italy. All right, the thirty-year bond in Italy is almost five percent already. Inflation was was lower in Italy but not as low as was expected, and more so the core rate rose to 6.4 from 6. Some of the numbers in Europe were encouraging, some were not, but the point is they're still all high compared to a 3% ECB rate. The main refi rate is 3%. That's their, you know, used to be the overnight emergency rate. Now it's the two-week, back to the two-week, which it used to be, and it's at 3% against inflation in Germany, which is, you know, above 8 for months in a row. Inflation in Italy, which is above 9 for months in a row. Inflation in other places, we, we specifically broke down Lithuania this past week, you know, so down from 11 to 9, but still 9. These countries' negative, negative real rates are just deep, minus 5, minus 6. So it's going to be tough to eradicate inflation there. So you talk about these kind of countries, take a case like Belgium, for example. I mean, these countries are still the most indebted countries ever. I mean, Italy, Spain, Greece, and Belgium on a per capita basis. Belgium's up there with Italy and Spain. So now all of a sudden the ECB is going to be, you know, carrying out shrinkage too, basically not buying bonds. And yet the spreads have barely moved. So I'm watching the spreads like, you know, the Italian two-year versus the German two-year, the Italian 10 against Germany. I mean, all of these cross bond spreads right now in Europe are huge. All right. But we have to take it a step further because, again, we're so U.S.-focused. And we get into this, you know, dynamic around the Fed and it's the only decision is what's the Fed going to do here? And there's so much more going on. And we're starting to see cracks develop in ways that lead to crises. Crises? Crises? The, <laughs> noting that the Turkish government just, I mean, the central bank just cut their interest rate like two weeks ago on the back of the fact that, of course, you know, you have a, an earthquake, which he said, look for the worst ever natural disasters in many cases. And unfortunately, I mean, that's something that's going to continue. All right. But in that sense, Turkey is a good case in point, not because of the earthquake, because this was already going on. The central bank was already cutting rates there because inflation was 80 percent year over year. Because at one point, the currency was down, you know, 90%, you know, dollar, dollar turkey, up 90%. All right, still a 33% rate of depreciation year over year, even though it's flattened out and the volatility's kind of died. But the fact of the matter is, when you take a place like Turkey, it's a country of 85 million people. This isn't chump change. This is no real kind of even third world country, man. You're talking about a major you know, economic country. I'm not going to say they're a power, but they're a major economic country with a lot of people living there with the, where the price of gold in lira was 6,500 lira in 2019 and it's 36,000 now. That's five times over. What does this mean? It takes five times as much money to buy something. Then we took at the inflation numbers, Food inflation is 69.7% year over year, and that's down from last month. Think about the loss of the purchasing power of the Turkish lira and the average Turkish 
worker, consumer, whatever, that maybe is lucky to, enough to have avoided any kind of contact or involvement or family you know, injury in this devastating natural disaster. They are choking, man. We're talking about places where it's bad and getting worse and we don't really talk about it too much. And then there's one more place I have to bring up because no one's going to talk about it. And because I love places like this where you can see the dynamic where other countries will eventually adopt the same path and yet we're not talking about it because it's a place called Pakistan. Who the heck wants to talk about, you know, the Karachi 100? I do. Because I everything matters to me. It's always been my buzzword. Everything matters to me. I want every single piece of information I can get because when I see what's happening in Pakistan, I can see it happening in other places. And here's why. All right. Their currency, down big. Inflation is a problem. Okay. How are they trying to address it? Well, they're actually been trying to address it fiscally. All right. Cutting, con uh, raising consumption taxes, raising excise taxes, ending energy subsidies. All right. So the fiscal side is tightening. <laughs> Unlike here in the U.S. where we just have trillions of dollars to spend on anything, right? Here's a country that's trying to do the quote-unquote right thing, if you will. I'm not making judgments, but from, a, from an academic standpoint, which I hate the whole academic viewpoint on anything because it's archaic and you throw it out the window, throw the textbooks out the windows anymore, okay? None of that matters now. This is a new age and everything's upside down and everyone knows it. So in the terms of the fiscal tightening they're going to do, all right, the currency gets hit. So what do they do? They raised interest rates on Friday by 300 basis points, taking their rate from 17 to 20 percent. They've been raising the rate basically the you know the entire time here since 2022 started last year. They've gone from 7 percent to 20 percent. Their currency made a new low this past week. So when you start to think about that. All right, where they are raising rates to try and defend the currency to bring inflation down and addressing it with fiscal policy, other countries will undertake this same process at some point going forward. And it's really going to be really interesting to see what happens to the currency there in terms of Pakistan. I think to change gears, though, uh, and talk a little bit about trading strategies and you know applying some, some disciplines and something that is pertinent to right now, and that is crude oil. You're going into a period now in the spring here, it's a spring thaw. I mean, if you look at history, you, want, you have any kind of conflict in this area of the world, you have a lot of spring offensives, man. And there's already some fierce stuff going on, it seems, again. The weaponry has been taken up a notch by both sides. The rhetoric coming out of Ukraine has become increasingly frantic and somewhat desperate, uh, basically saying, if you know, if you don't help us here, you know, you're going to be fighting them on behalf of NATO because they're coming for you next type of stuff, right? I think that this situation is going to deteriorate could be quickly. And I think in terms of history and the spring frost and all these things, it's just, hey, the risk is higher. I'm not saying, hey, let's predict something big's going to happen. But if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here and now for sure. All right. And this whole thing around the U.S. saying, oh, well, China, you can't help out the Ukraine. You can't help out rather Russia, please. You know, you can't send them anything or do it. It's like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? I mean, did you not did you miss the meeting between Putin and Xi in, in, during the Olympics with the 30 trillion Rimnimbi deal on oil and then natural gas and involved Kazakhstan and it's all state uh, Chinese bank loans to Russia in Rimnimbi. And, you know, they're going to price the Earl's crude benchmark, the Dubai price traded in Rimnimbi in Shanghai. Hello. This is all about resources, energy and food, China and Russia. Ukraine, the breadbasket to ship food to China. Food is the number one security problem, that, as said by the at the plenary session here, just recently ended, where Xi came out and said, our the number one concern of the Communist Party for the next five years is food security. Number one. Well, hello. Hello, McFly. Wake up. By the time this is over, you know, they'll own Taiwan. They'll threaten to drop the, the petro currency uh, card. And, you know, I mean, holy mackerel. But anyway, so in terms of crude oil, at a time when it has gone nowhere but gone everywhere. This is a great case in point for range trading for a market that is kind of biding time. Let's take a look at the history, all right? In the, in, uh, let's go back to June. June 14th was a high level around 103. We're talking about WTI, the front month contract. 103, June 14th. By July 14th, one month later, it would fall into 8150, down over 20 bucks. Then in the next seven days, it went back to 91 bucks, up 10. Then it fell nine into August 6th, rose eight into August 25th, 
spelled 13 into September 28th, all within basically less than a month. November 7th is back up to $89, a rally of 12 bucks in five weeks. Then by December 9th, a month later, it's all the way down to 71. It fell $18. By January 19th, it's back up to 82. By February 6th, it's down to 72. So what do we do? Well, I'd say, first of all, 81.70 was kind of the high on January 19th, right? So in that context, that's a pivot point. I look at the 200-day moving average at 79.88. I look at the 100-day at 79.18. I look at the two-year moving average, 73.18, and not a single close below it this entire time. And the 52-week moving average at 80.61. So we have the zone between 81.70 and 79.20. All right, so you have about a buck, two hundred and fifty rather, uh, of a, of a zone where you have all kinds of buy signals if you can get above those levels. Do I want to wait for eighty one seventy to be taken out? I don't know yet, but I'll tell you what: you do have this kind of thing where seventy three eighteen is a very clear stop level and it's well defined risk reward. And just getting back to the high of one hundred three in June, which is not out of the question if something breaks in in Russia slash Ukraine. I mean, this could be a decent trade. So, you know, keep kind of just keeping an eye on that. I mean, you know, the issue here is the volatility. You can see the volatility wide. I mean, you're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars swings in a month. And end of the day, I mean, basically, you are right where you were, July 14th. You've gone nowhere. You've gone nowhere. And you've had all these massive swings. So this is really tough if you're trying to be long or short. You've gotten filleted either way. Bull traps, bear traps, all kinds of traps, man. I mean, it's really dangerous out there. But in the context of thinking something's coming, being prepared, looking at this breakdown, looking at the technicals, having this overlay and a fundamental backdrop, if we see the you know the S hit the fan, we know what we want to do. We want to be long crude oil. We want to be long gasoline, and we want to um, you know use these metrics to kind of give us a guide as to how to get in. I mean, to me, the fact that you know the the, two, the 52 weeks 8061, and the 200 day is 7988, that gives you less than a dollar range there, right at either side of 80 bucks, where you can then look to, for shorter term signals as we get up there and as we vacillate around this area uh, to maybe determine when to get in. And then, of course, you know, for risk, I mean, okay, to me, it's, you know, we know it's 100, 100, uh, 100 times, you know, the contract, right, for, for crude oil. So the degree to which, you know, each $10 is a thousand, each dollar is a thousand bucks, right? So in that context, you know, you're talking about maybe, you know, quite a bit of risk, but at the same time, the upside, you know, you're looking at a ratio that is very tight. You know, two and a half, three to one at a minimum, because if, again, if things pop off in Russia, you're going to have a, you know, big move. The other thing I would mention too, and we've talked about before, is sugar cane is the ETF making a new high. Big breakout in the last uh, week or so. Just another thing I want to mention, because we're always looking for those commodities. We are, of course, you know, long sugar for our clients. And uh, hopefully, you know, we talked about that in the last uh, podcast. So where are we now going forward? It's pretty simple. I mean, the volatility is there. Right, but the price changes and asset prices kind of hasn't, and I think the Fed will keep pushing until they get the disinflation and the pain in asset prices, stocks in particular. The question is, does the dollar cooperate? I don't know if the dollar cooperates. The dollar doesn't seem to really want to cooperate, and that speaks volumes on its own. I mean, watching the Pakistani rupee get whacked when the Indian rupee looks really strong. So that's one thing I'm keeping an eye on. But the point here is you're going to have multiple opportunities here when the pain comes to the downside in stocks and some of these commodities and then a major buying opportunity when you do get the flip, when the reflation trade comes back big. Uh, I think that that just happens from lower levels. But again, you know, this is all the Fed and this is Jerome Powell pulling a Nick Walenda, trying to walk across Niagara Falls on the tightrope, holding a bounce beam, man. You bounce. It's like too tight for too long, the economy goes. Not tight enough for not long enough, and you get back into an inflation dynamic. For me, the bottom line is the stage has already been set because you've you've violated 40-year trends that go back to 1979. Lower lows in inflation and interest rates. You're not going to see that again. The flip side is here. 
And that's why it's more important to do other things, too, that we always talk about in terms of not just being buy and hold stocks. You probably won't keep up with the inflation over the longer haul. You need to be involved in the commodities. You need to be involved in the currencies. You need to be on both sides of stocks and bonds. And I think the futures market is a great tool for that. ETFs is another way to play that. So, again, we'll continue to discuss these things. But I think in terms of the opportunities, right now it's been a time to be patient, and it's been tough to be patient. But I think that time lasts a little bit longer. And then I'm telling you, 2023 is still going to have some tremendous opportunities. Keep an eye on crude oil. Keep an eye on really, let's let's go over those levels one more time because the real key levels to me are 79.88 on the upside in crude, the 200-day moving average, 81.70 would be the upside breakout pivot for me in this entire big range trade, which has had a downward tilt for the crude oil market. Check us out on Twitter. Check us out on Instagram. And uh, you'll see the cool charts that I've been talking about in some of these cases, and uh, uh, particularly like the charts of uh, the um, Turkish, uh, the gold and Turkish lira. I mean, again, it's like, man, when you talk about this and talk about all these countries that are going through this, really what it is, is the purchasing power of their currencies are getting wasted, man. Wasted. And Turkey is a great case in point. 85 million people with a natural disaster. Man, it's a dangerous, dangerous situation out there. Greg Weldon, until next time, thanks for listening.